Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, Wednesday at 3 p.m. here in Honolulu, Energy in America. And we talked to Lou Pudirisi of ePrink every couple of weeks. We love talking to Lou wherever he is. And in fact, he's been <laughs> plenty of places lately. Hi, Lou. Welcome back to Washington and to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. <laughs> so you came back from Nagoya. What, what did you do in Nagoya? What was going on there? It had something to do with LNG? So, yes. Yeah. Right. So um, the, uh, the Energy Policy Research Foundation, or EPRINC, and the Institute for Energy Economics Japan were, uh, have received support from the governments of Japan and the governments of the United States to uh, help support the effort on the future of Asian LNG. And uh, on October 22nd, the seventh annual meeting of the world's consumer and producing LNG uh, you know, uh, producers and consumers met in Nagoya to talk about, uh, you know, next steps and what we should do to expand world LNG uh, markets and uh, what role the U.S. can play in that. From, from our Japan early discussions, well. I would guess, and, uh, from our early discussions, I would guess this is one of your favorite conferences and, um, and that you participated in this, this conference. This, this is a... This is a very big deal. It's the second year we have uh, provided some of the analytical basis for the conference. And in fact, the government of Japan and the U.S. Uh, nominated us to do a third year of the project. So we're quite excited about That's that. That's great. Let's and look at some pictures, Lou. We got, we got yeah, some pictures. We got yeah, a picture so let's go to the first. Nagoya. So, yeah, so un unlike, uh, unlike, uh, the previous years, this was not held in Tokyo, but moved about two hours by bullet train south to the town of Nagoya, which is home of a large conglomerate of a Japanese trading organization formed of utilities called JERA. And the first uh, photo there shows, actually doesn't show the castle. If you go to our website, you'll see the castle. But it shows the guardhouse to the castle. It was a very famous castle in the 17th century in Nagoya. And this is just to give the audience a little local color. In fact, the original castle was bombed in World War II, but, re, but rebuilt in the 50s. Uh, the next photo up shows the, you know, the sign just introducing all the delegates, so your audience can see uh, sort of the, what, what, you know, sort of the basic uh, uh, sort of entrance. And then the third photo here shows you how well attended it is. In fact, uh, we had slightly over a thousand attendees this year. Mm, that's huge. And so we had energy ministers. Yeah, so we had energy ministers about 10 countries, senior officials from 25 countries, uh, major industry officials. And you can see in this photo, actually, that man with gray hair standing up is getting ready to make some comments. And he is Fatih Birol, who is the uh, ex executive director, you know, essentially the president of the International Energy Agency out of Paris. Mm -hmm. It's a high, you know, it's a big international event. And uh, as we've talked many times in the past, LNG is very important to many Asian economies as a fuel diversity for energy security, and very importantly, either as a, as a resource to be used with renewables or just directly to address air pollution, local air pollution, which is a growing concern in many, many uh, Asian capitals and, and uh, cities. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Lou. Was China there? Did you see China? Where do they stand in this conference? China was there. No, actually, China was there. They made a very interesting presentation. The Chinese National Petroleum Company, several, many delegates from China were there. And uh, they, they, uh, their basic theme was that they were deregulating more and more of their economy, at least the energy economy. And a larger portion of the Chinese economy can you know, individual entrepreneurs or utilities, local communities can access LNG market without inter in interference from the national uh, the national government. So, so that you, was in the process, did you see anything that reflected a, a friction because of the tariffs, or is uh, LNG something that's not affected by the tariffs 
and China is all too happy to well, be no, in this LNG, organization. So, yeah, uh, LNG is affected by the tariffs. I would say um, senior U.S. energy officials and senior U.S. energy industry executives and their counterparts in China do not view the tariffs as a long-run problem. It's a short-run problem. I mean, they, you know, they basically have a long view, and they believe this will get worked out. Now, I would say the tariffs, which I think are, can be as much as uh, 10 to 20 percent on LNG, do not seem to be affecting Chinese LNG demand. And because the U.S. is just one of several players, like a lot of portfolio players are just swapping the LNG around and moving non-U.S. LNG to China and backing out the LNG into other markets. So, so far, I don't think it's a big problem. I think it would be a big problem if it persists over a, a several production cycles. But right now, I think most folks think that this is going to get worked out. Now, I do think there was a very interesting report this morning in the Financial Times by two well-known Chinese economists who stated that the trade frictions with the U.S. are are largely because the failure of the Chinese government to reform its direct intervention in the economy. Wow. And those, uh, and we were quite surprised yeah. to see that. And uh, I understand those lectures and those uh, presentations were removed from the internet, but there was a direct <laughs> kind of contradiction of the of the central regime's view on that. So it's, I hope that's, that's the end that's, of it. That's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what I thought I'd do for your audience is just quickly take them through the presentation uh, Institute for Energy Economics Japan and EPRINC made at the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, we only had, uh, I think, seven to eight minutes total, so it won't take long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let's go to the first slide. This is just the title page. You don't, we don't need to spend any time on that. And I think the first... The first, uh, you know, the, the next uh, slide that comes up is what we call wild cards, China and India. And the interesting thing about LNG is that it's a very, what we call in the economics profession, a lumpy investment. It takes a huge amount of capital to get started. And historically, uh, buyers and sellers have had to get married and make a long-term commitment and to be very creditworthy to get the banks to put up the money. Mm -hmm. So, and one of the things it doesn't, the LNG market historically has not been able to deal with is a lot of uncertainty on demand. So generally, and what is happening now is the market is transitioning from one in which you have these very fixed long-term deals to which buyers want more flexibility. Particularly Asian, Asian buyers in developing countries say, well, yeah, we really like the LNG when it's priced right. We don't want to buy it if it gets too expensive. Okay. And then we're going to switch back to coal. Or we want to switch. We want to be able to fuel switch. So when you talk about Asian buyers. Dealing with this is a real challenge. When you talk about Asian buyers, Lou, are you, are you talking about private companies, state-owned companies? Or are you talking about the, sta the states so, themselves? Yes. You're talking about, yeah, it depends where you are, whether if you're in Vietnam or Indonesia. In many cases, you're talking about utility companies, which are either owned by the state or clearly regulated by the state. You can have uh, what they call independent power producers, but still they, they are in, in a kind of market regulated by the state. So, And uh, one of the things we wanted to point out to everyone was that in China, I, we really do, you know, China is the elephant in the room. They are going to be buying a lot of LNG. Uh, when I was, I left, when I left the Goya, I did go to Nanjing for a few days. And the first thing that struck me was that everyone was driving an electric scooter. This local air pollution, everyone in China knows what PM 2.5 is. Nobody knows what PM 2.5 is in the U.S., but in the big cities in China, Everyone knows what it is. They can look on their app and tell you what the number is today. So it is a big political issue. And what, what we just wanted to show in this first slide is, one, 
is that as you go out, the potential variance in Chinese demand for LNG becomes very big. And so, one of, and that's largely driven for the pace at which they introduce new power plants, which generate power through natural gas as opposed to coal. And there's an uncertainty on that rate of development. And the, India is a bit different. In India, they are going to use coal for electric production, but they will be using natural gas for distribution to cities, for you know residential and industrial uses in the urban centers, and they're hooking up their pipelines. So these are the two wild cards, and one of the things we're going to be doing next year is engaging with both the authorities in both those countries to get a much better handle on what do they need to see and how can they address their requirements for long-term LNG and maybe reduce this uncertainty a bit. So I think that that's one of the big themes out of our report this year to the to the attendees. The next slide called U.S. LNG Supply Security. I won't spend a lot of time on this one. I think we've talked about this a lot. But if you look at that squiggly gray line there, that shows you the price of uh, natural gas in Henry Hub. And that essentially is the feedstock for producing LNG in the U.S. And the rapidly rising red part of the graph there is the unconventional natural gas production. And the basic theme on this slide is, look, we have lots of natural gas in the U.S., and that even as the Asian demand gets to be quite high, the U.S. feedstock is not going to go up in price very much. So the U.S. is going to be competitive in these LNG markets if we can get all the other pieces to work right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we had two sets of, ma we, had, we had a set of major findings. Actually, our findings are much longer than this. You, any one of your readers can pull the report up right off our website. It's been posted on there since the day of the conference. But I think the best thing is that uh, the, uh, you know, the, we still are not getting, we believe, although the Canadian, the, there was an announcement in Canada of a major new uh, LNG facility in northern, uh, nor on the west coast of Canada, up in Kitimat. But, I, but, but basically, one of the concerns we raised is, look, there's this growing LNG demand, but the investment community has yet to commit to enough new projects so that we have a lot of confidence the supply is going to be there. Okay. So we need to find different ways to address these financial risks. Then there's this thing we just talked about, a growing need for more flexibility. We're going to have to find a way for the LNG market to look more like the oil market, in which people can ramp up, ramp down, move supplies around. Um, the emerging buyers of India and China are going to be dominant players in the LNG consumer market, and we better figure out how their demand is going to progress over time. And we're going to have to talk to them, engage with them on a regular basis. Um, destination restrictions still remain a problem. This is more Japanese than a U.S. problem because the U.S. has no destination restrictions. But uh, we want, if, we, if we're going to have a flexible market, countries like Qatar and Australia are going to have to cease requiring buyers to use their LNG or, or, and, and have no option to reallocate it to other destinations, right? See, there's a big problem for Japan, for example. They don't know the pace at which nuclear power is going to come back online. And so they can make commitments for LNG, but if they don't need it, they want to have the right to resell it into the market. Mm -hmm. Not a problem for the U.S. The U.S. does not require destination restrictions, but there's still a hangover from the past in places like Qatar and Australia. And the Japan Foreign Trade Council has, say, has stated that it is inherently uncompetitive and should be stopped. Okay, so that's it. And that uh, the other problem, I think, is, is in some parts of Asia, um, Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand, there still needs to be a lot of capacity building in human capital to learn how to use LNG, how to set, to establish a regulatory framework, what to do about the pricing of it, all these things. And there's a lot of money from Japan, particularly, going into this human capital development throughout Asia. Well, this all so sounds like it's on, the, it. it's on the track you described uh, earlier when we started 
talking about LNG sure. development, global LNG development. Um, and uh, it sounds like this is a conference that is, is looking at uh, a kind of a coiled spring of expansion happening within the next year or two um, all around the world. I mean, you, you predicted this. You, you told us this would happen, that it would go into yeah. Asia, that the U.S. would be a big supplier, uh, that uh, Japan would be uh, a focal point in, in the transshipment. Um, it's, it's all happening, am I right? That's why this conference was so important. It's all, it's, it's, it's all happening, and uh, once again, uh, more data than you'll ever want to see is in the report, so uh, <laughs> I recommend the folks to take a look at it. And then maybe we can quickly just go to the policy recommendations. And uh, so I mean, the policy recommendations really follow from the findings. One is... Uh, we need to get rid of destination restrictions. I think the Japanese Foreign Trade Council is talking to the DOE and the U.S. Foreign Trade and U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, we need to have a good benchmark price for gas in the Pacific, and there's a lot of debate on how this is going to happen. But if we have a lot, if we have a lot of transparency in the trades in a growing spot market, a growing futures market, both physical and financial markets. Buyers and sellers will have more confidence that they can engage in uh, engage in these transactions and hedge their bets. Uh, we're going to have to talk to these emerging LNG markets and see if we can come to some better understanding of what their strategy is long term, what they really need. Uh, project development is going to need a lot more fast tracking. I think both in, both on the receiving side and on the U.S. side. U.S. side has made real progress with FERC and stuff. But on the other side, there's going to be a lot more work needs to be on fast track. And these projects cannot, you can't dither over whether to do this for years on end. You have to decide quickly in order to start to lock this in. Um, there's going to be uh, government assistance, uh, you know, let's say financial assistance, loan guarantees, traditional foreign trade assistance is going to take place on a much broader scale in terms of export credit assistance in these emerging markets. And then uh, we're going to need new ways to deal with the risk of LNG investment, maybe having investors buy into the whole integrated value chain. And these, all these issues were discussed extensively at the conference. If I'm an excited investor and I, and I want to get in on LNG because I can see it essentially exploding right. globally, um, where do I look? What kind of uh, security or instrument do I look to? What do I, what do I, uh, what do I want to um, examine well, you can, in order to make you, an you investment? Can, yeah, so you can, you, yeah, so you can do a couple of things. I mean, you can um, buy directly into a company like Chenier or Tellurian or even Shell or Exxon Mobil or Driftwood. There are all these uh, potential new. Uh, developers in the U.S. Uh, Tellurian has a very interesting model in which you can, you know, for the LNG, uh, it's not just related to the LNG community, but an uh, LNG buyer can essentially buy into the entire value chain in which the price is fixed. And it's a somewhat, uh, it's a very interesting thing. So in a sense, your risk of an escalation in the feedstock cost or the risk of escalation in the liquefaction cost are completely covered because you now own a piece of the entire value chain. Mm -hmm. And so there, are, so there's, there are, folks are, are, are addressing these, these kinds of risks with new kinds of instruments. Yeah. Well, it's like reinventing, uh, you know, all the, what do you want to call it, the infrastructure of, of security instruments uh, that we developed in oil. Before we go to the break, Lou, uh, can you give us exactly, the name of your exactly. website? Um, so that, uh, you know, we can look yes, at this report right, in its entirety. Yeah, eprink.org, E-P-R-I-N-C dot O-R-G. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. I want to talk about Nanjing, yeah. at least for a moment. That's Lou Pugliarisi, president of Eprink. Sure. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us 
Every other Monday, aloha. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Energy in America, we're back with Lou Pugliarisi, joins us from Washington, D.C. Um, and we're talking about, um, the, you know, the, uh, the trip he made to uh, LNG conference in Nagoya. So you mentioned the name of your website, which is eprink.com? Uh, .org. .org, sorry. And, uh, dot .org. Perfect, as a, as a think tank should be. Um, and then, <laughs> and then uh, you mentioned during the break that you that you had some very interesting articles uh, on the website that we ought to take a look at. Yeah. So, that? if anyone who's interested in this topic, when they go to the website, of course they can pull down the entire report. But they'll also see that we published uh, my counterpart in Japan. And I published two pieces, virtually on the day of the conference. One in the Japan Times and one in the Nikkei Asia Review, both in English. And I think they give you a much tighter view of policy opinion on what we should be doing. That's great. I would encourage anyone interested in the topic will find those interesting. This is great. It's great to be able to follow this with you, Lou. So I understand after you left Nagoya, yeah. you went to Nanjing, and that's not close. That must be a 1,000 miles away at least. Um, and what did you do in I Nanjing? I like a three-hour three trip. Well, I, I had actually, a, one thing is I have a son from UH Manoa who's on a flagship scholarship there. Ah. And I also gave a lecture at the, uh, I wanted to look, on, look in on him, see if he was okay. <laughs> and then also, I was also invited by the university to give a lecture to the International Relations Department and the graduate students there. So can you give us a praise uh, of that whole lecture? Question of, uh, what, did you, what did you talk about? Yeah, I mean, let me... So I, I, I sort of took them through, you know, they're very interested in the questions of tariffs and U.S. and Sino-U.S. relations, but I don't think they really had a good context for thinking about it, right? And uh, so I spent some time thinking about, you know, what is the kind of geopolitical paradigm for China? And what is the geopolitical paradigm for the U.S.? And I think one of the interesting things that we don't think about is that even though China has traditionally been a very land-based, you know, consolidation of the Han, protection of the northern, you know, the northern frontier, uh, people forget that China, even though it's a major exporter, it is a huge importer by sea of the uh, of commodities into China. It's essential for the operation of the Chinese economy. And this is where I think some of the, some of the kind of pressure points are arising, and that uh, and it should be an area where long-term the U.S. and China could cooperate, not one which should be viewed as a form of conflict. But I mean, I think both from the U.S. side, we see the Chinese expansion into the South China Sea and the, and the encroachment upon traditional uh, open navigation uh, routes as a part of a power grab. Uh, of course, from the Chinese perspective, they are trying to protect these routes for the importation of essential supplies to run their economy. And, uh, and uh, of course, the other aspect of the commercial disagreement is the uh, long-standing dispute with China of the heavy involvement in the national economy, which distorts the trading relationships. Mm. And the U.S. is not the only one complaining about this, right? Mm. The Europeans, the South East, East Asian countries, lots of folks are complaining about this. And how we're going to resolve this, I don't know. I believe we will get there eventually, but it may take some time. Well, it sounds like you're a, a kind of a citizen diplomat, Lou. Uh, <laughs> go over there and talk about things that are somewhat sensitive, but you try to educate the Chinese on things they should know about. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, the students are easy to talk to. They have a very flexible attitudes about life. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about it's where it goes. Room. Let's talk about where it goes from here. I mean, we we we've sort of established that this is you know is hastening um, that the years to come, even with the stresses and strains of diplomatic relations as they presently exist with China. Um, that uh, we're going to be we're going to be selling a lot of LNG overseas. This is going to be an important thing right. for the United I think States. More important. Yeah, so more importantly, if you look at the elite here, Europe, stuff, they're preoccupied by climate, right? Carbon. But in these Asian countries, Jakarta, Beijing, Nanjing, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, wherever you are. The, the political pressure the leadership is feeling is people look outside and say, hey, I can't see the sun. You need to do something about it. And, you know, even in these communist countries, they can't kind of ignore this issue because it's really, you know, it's kind of a mass movement. And I find it curious that, you know, we're all preoccupied by climate. But actually, what they're doing will have probably a very beneficial effect on climate. But it's not driven by climate. It's driven by local air pollution. <laughs> and all through Asia, it's a very big deal. Uh -huh. Because people can see it in their daily life. You know, they can see that the air is, is not clean. Right. Well, what about, uh, what about in the Americas? Uh, you know, we just had a show a minute ago with um, uh, Carlos Juarez, who is our correspondent on a show called Global Connections in Mexico, uh, in a university mm -hmm. just east of Mexico City. And um, talking about the caravans, talking about American immigration policy. But what we didn't talk about was uh, Mexican uh, energy policy. And uh, you mentioned before the show began sure. that you have, you have plans for Mexico, Lou. What are your plans for Mexico? Yes, yeah, sir. So first, we're going to try to. Uh, we, we are. We have a paper uh, that's uh, being produced now. I think it should actually be ready for uh, editing and a review on November first to look at the entire energy reform program in Mexico and try to put some estimates of what is the value of that reform program. It's kind of a way to start a discussion among influence leaders in Mexico, particularly the new AMLO, you know, the Obrador administration, on uh, their initiatives to, let's say, alter the reform program. Now, maybe the program should be altered in different ways, but I think the fundamental value of the program is very high. And we should begin to engage them in a discussion. Okay, what you know, what what do the what is the reality? What is the analysis? What do the data tell us about how valuable this reform program is? And the thinking is, once we get that paper published and in the public domain, we will go down to Mexico City and begin to think about something a little similar we've done with the Japanese, is to engage with a with a kind of counterparty to ours to begin to say, okay, let's go through an agenda of important topics in the energy area and think about what do we need to understand so we can all get on the same page. Because Mexico is very important to the future of the U.S. North, the U.S. kind of oil and gas production platform. It's absolutely essential that Mexico remain highly integrated. But actually the future of the Mexican uh, energy platform and uh, the cost of gas and gasoline, it's also important they remain integrated with us. Yeah. So to the extent that folks on both sides of the border have some strange views or views which are not supported by the data or by traditional analysis, we want to get both sides to begin to talk about that and buy into it and see if we can find some common ground. Yeah, Mexico is uh, even you know despite our current uh, diplomatic issues with them and the president's um, uh, policies on them, uh, they're they're our friends and uh, they are our destinies are intertwined. And your destiny, actually, Lou, is is to uh, become as global as energy is becoming. Um, you're traveling more, you're, you're engaging more in more places. I noticed that, and I'd like to follow. I'd like to follow you wherever you go, Lou. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Lou Pugliarisi, the president of EPRINC in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us, Lou.
Okay, my pleasure, Jay. Sayonara. <laughs>